Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tom Kijewski and I'm a host here today. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you at the Diplomacy Talk Series um, event of the Warsaw Institute, one of the leading uh, geopolitical think tanks in uh, Central Europe, focusing on building a stable security environment in the region. And today we are joined by our special guest, Mr. Richard, Richard Grenell. Uh, it's great to have you here, Richard. Thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Grenell is an American diplomat, uh, an ambassador in, uh, of the US uh, in uh, Germany, and uh, former special presidential um, uh, envoy to Serbia and Kosovo, uh, peace negotiations. Uh, one of his um, biggest um, uh, career uh, uh, my stones, my stones was uh, uh, serving as an acting director for national intelligence in the US. He's a graduate of uh, Harvard University. And today we would like to talk about uh, new developments in uh, US-German relations and in the framework of energy security, and NATO and relations with Russia. Um, we would like to, to focus on Nord Stream 2. I, I know that uh, you are very interested in this subject, uh, Rick, and uh, it's been one of the main points uh, in, in, uh, in the news recently, right? Absolutely, so, uh, it's a very um, Yes. So what do you think? Uh, do you think that U.S. administration, uh, current administration of Biden, um, did, a, a, did the right thing, allowing uh, to, 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 to complete the, the pipeline? And uh, what, what are your, your thoughts on this? Well, what I was going to say is this is a very big deal, not only for Germany and for Europe, but also for the United States. For uh, a very long time, decades actually, U.S. policy has been to try to ensure that Europe and our European partners have a diversified energy source. And that's very simple in why the U.S. wants that uh, to happen. We feel strongly that the transatlantic alliance needs to be free of Russian leverage we never want to be in a position for any member of NATO. And remember, NATO exists to make sure that uh, we don't have any problems in Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, around the world. And NATO is the most successful military alliance in the history of the world. And so for us to be a good member of NATO means that you're constantly making sure that this strong transatlantic alliance is free of Russian manipulation and free of Russian leverage. We, the United States, have always thought that some Russian energy should be included in that diversification mix for Europe. So Nord Stream 1, for instance, is appropriate. <clears throat> We felt very strongly in multiple administrations, Democrats and Republicans, that Nord Stream 2 goes too far. It allows too much Russian leverage, too much uh, feeding of the beast of Russia by uh, allowing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to be completed. This is why the United States has stood firmly against Nord Stream 2, is because we believe that it protects Europe. It protects Europe from being manipulated by the Russians. And we all know that, that Russia will look for ways to manipulate others and to use that leverage to their advantage. And so being free of Nord Stream 2 and being free of the ability of, for the Russians to leverage you um, should be a priority for the transatlantic alliance. It's very puzzling to us why the German government does not see that. And at the same time, for many Americans, it's not only troubling, but it's disappointing and shocking that 
this mix of the Germans ignoring, the German government ignoring the leverage that is being placed over them from, from Russia through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, also not paying their fair share at NATO. Many Americans will say, you're feeding the beast. Uh, we don't understand why you can think that you can be a good member of NATO and yet not understand the leverage that you're giving up to, to Russia. And so I, I think that most Americans think you, you aren't a very good member of NATO. You're a disappointing member of NATO when you don't pay your fair share and you give uh, an, a whole bunch of money, too much money, too much leverage, too much, uh, you give up too much to the Russians by purchasing uh, gas through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline when there should be alternatives. Yes, I think, uh, I mean, it's perfectly, uh, uh, you know, justifiable view. And uh, the, when we can, when I was talking with Ambassador Palmer uh, in, in November, uh, you know, from, from uh, US uh, Bureau of Energy Resources, Department of State, she clearly mentioned a uh, similar, let's say, a stance as, as you, that uh, it's not about uh, acting against uh, uh, this country or another, but just about freedom of, of doing business and uh, and free trade of energy. When when it's uh, uh, balanced, it's good. Uh, but what what do you think uh, can be um, a res result for this uh, when we talk about national security and international security in the region of Central Europe? And I'm thinking about the conflict in Ukraine and tensions between Russian uh, and, um, and Ukrainian uh, partners. Well, first of all, we need to make one thing clear is that um, the German people do not always agree with the German government on this issue. And I have heard from a lot of my German friends who believe in the transatlantic alliance and want to see it flourish. And therefore, they uh, constantly will ask their own government, the German government, why are you doing this? Why are you uh, not seeing this hypocrisy of feeding the beast of Russia while ignoring their, their march and their leverage into Europe? And I think that there's only one answer, and that's that the German government doesn't see the threats the way the rest of the transatlantic transatlantic alliance sees the threat. We in America see very clearly that, that Russia can be, uh, you know, manipulating its partners and that it works very hard to have leverage over them. But for some reason, the, the German government or some in the German government don't see the threats that clearly. And that's what's been troubling to us the most is that the threat assessment between Russia and the United States is, is growing completely differently. I would also add uh, to that Iran, where the Germans are in the lead, uh, asking for a normalization agreement uh, with Iran to do trade with Iran. Um, that's clearly because the German government doesn't see Iran as the threat that the transatlantic alliance does. I, I think I would put um, Venezuela in that same category. I would put China. Uh, the threat that the German government um, sees from China is much different than what Americans see. And so there's been a lot of talk about President Trump undermining the transatlantic alliance. And I think that that's been uh, completely uh, the wrong way to view it because if there's any uh, threat to the transatlantic alliance, it's been the German government and their policies. They are the ones who have undermined NATO by not paying their bills. They are the ones who have underlined the transatlantic alliance by pursuing a pipeline with Russia that is clearly gonna give Russia leverage. They're the ones who, when President Trump brought forward this uh, moment take on the Chinese government 
and their manipulation of currency and their manipulation in the trade, um, you know, uh, trade agreements and what they did to us in, 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 with COVID-19. President Trump tried to tackle this issue and at, at the same time that we were trying to confront the Chinese, Chancellor Merkel uh, took 10 CEOs from Germany over to China to sign trade agreements. And so there's another example where the German government doesn't see the threat the same way that many members of the Transatlantic Alliance uh, see the threat. Um, you know, the German intelligence services will warn German businesses uh, and German tourists, before you go to China, you should leave your phone at home. You should not bring your phone into China. Now, that's a warning from the German intelligence services that is a very real warning. And the reason why they do that is because the German intelligence services sees China as a threat, stealing data. And yet the German government uh, doesn't follow through with their policies on it. So if there's any uh, government that I think is the outlier, I think it's the Germans that have worked very hard to have a Germany first economic model and have ignored uh, many in Europe who call for greater sharing of, of the burden. And so uh, I'd like to continue to put the focus on the German government. We've got a long history between America and, and the German government and German people. And we love that commitment. And we feel like we can speak very freely with the Germans because we have so much in common with them. The German people love to work. They love to work hard. They believe in capitalism. And so they share a lot with the Americans. And we uh, have worked, we Americans have worked very hard to make uh, our policy push for a free and united, unified Germany. And and so we're, we're very much uh, connected and and therefore we want to make sure that the germans aren't the transatlantic connection and somehow blaming uh donald trump for for pushing the, uh, the transatlantic alliance away we believe very much that it, it's been the germans that have moved away from the transatlantic alliance yeah very good point uh especially when we when we take into consideration the recent uh, moves towards signing uh, a trade deal between European Union and China uh, uh, which was supported by Germany uh, so uh, it's very let's say uh, one point I would like to add to that is that um, you know I, I've said this but I want to expand on it a little bit is that the German people um, I hear from every day uh, people who thank uh, Americans for being a strong defender of the transatlantic alliance and wanting to pull the Germans back into that transatlantic alliance. And so I think that as we go into uh, the elections in Germany, that there's a very good debate about what the German government policy should be and that there are uh, millions of people who believe that the German government has to do a better job of honoring the transatlantic uh, alliance and being um, just innately democratic and innately for capitalism and democracy. And uh, that, that's where I think uh, I'd like to see the debate go in Germany when, when uh, the candidates come forward to talk about foreign policy. I hope that they will believe in the transatlantic alliance enough to make the tough decisions. Yes, let's let's hope uh, it will be the, the outcome of, of the elections uh, in Germany soon, and uh, that the, the strong uh, let's say take on, on uh, cooperation within NATO will prevail. Uh, I would like just to come back uh, for a second uh, to the Nord Stream two uh, case. Uh, when I was attending a conference, an uh, energy conference recently in, in Warsaw, Poland, uh, one of the panelists uh, mentioned that uh, important fact that uh, the, the German uh, foreign policy has uh, great continuity and Nord Stream pipeline has been uh, initiated by social democratic uh, government of Gerhard Schroeder. 
and it uh, it's been uh, finished by by uh, let's say uh, Christian Democrats uh, of Angela Merkel. Uh, do you think it's uh, it's something we could uh, let's say uh, discuss or this this the foreign policy of, of Germany regardless of um, of the governments political parties in power? Look, I, I think uh, it remains to be seen how the elections shake out in September uh, if the CDU and the replacement for uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, comes someone who believes in the transatlantic alliance or is willing to cave to Russian influence. I am concerned about Armin Laschet uh, and the comments that he's made recently it seems to me that um, he ha he won't stand up to Russia and he's willing to uh, kind of let the transatlantic relationship suffer by uh, not understanding the threat that Russia has. They continue to want to have a normalized trade uh, a agreement and relationship with a variety of countries. And I think that's um, that, that's you know, unfortunate. The Greens in in Germany uh, seem to have a much stronger position on Nord Stream 2 for different reasons, but um, their foreign policy, when you look back, when you take a step back and you look at the outcome of the foreign policy, in many ways, the Greens have a very good foreign policy that, that uh, we can get behind in some instances. Now, that's not totally true across the board, but there are a few examples uh, where they are stronger than the CDU when it comes to foreign affairs. Thank you very much, Rick, for your thoughts. Uh, I would like to now uh, touch upon the, the issue of uh, military um, contribution to NATO uh, uh, and uh, Berlin policy in this regard. Uh, we know that, that uh, they are making progress in, in increasing their GDP spending on defense, I think it was 1.2% uh, uh, in 17, and now it's, uh, I think, more than 1.5% one, uh, one of GDP committed to, uh, to defense. And I think it was one of the, the main, um, let's say, mis misinformation about uh, Donald Trump, uh, let's say, uh, urging NATO, including Germany, to uh, increase their, their defense capabilities. And it was presented sometimes, maybe too often, as an uh, anti-NATO uh, policy. Uh, what, what would you like to, uh, to add? Well, look, I, I think most people could see uh, that that was just media manipulation. Um, it goes without saying that the United States believes in NATO because we've been giving uh, an incredible amount of money to NATO and troops as well. And so the idea that somehow we, the United States, uh, are not committed to NATO while other countries aren't even paying their obligations um, is silly. I mean, if, for any real reporter to check the facts and to see who's paying and who's not paying um, is a very simple task. But of course, in this Trump, Trump deranged syndrome world that we live in, uh, so many media were just completely focused on Donald Trump. And when he talked about reforming NATO, there was a hue and cry to say, oh, he's undermining NATO. And I think that it's a dangerous, slippery slope when you have an outsider like Donald Trump, who's not a politician and doesn't claim to be a politician, but somebody who from the outside can look at the end results and not just the process, because so many times politicians love the process. And Donald Trump was less interested in the process and more interested in, in the outcomes. And he would look at the bottom line to see who's paying at NATO and who wasn't. And it was a very simple thing to him. And uh, he felt like the Americans were being taken advantage of. We consistently have asked, you know, I, I as U.S. ambassador to Germany, I looked, looked back at the U.S. ambassadors uh, before me. And multiple U.S. ambassadors had been asking the German government to pay their fair share. The German government had consistently and for years ignored U.S. ambassadors, just flat out ignored. There was an individual from 
Berlin at uh, an NGO think tank that when I left, tweeted a response, and I've been tweeting, highlighting it consistently, but this individual tweeted, um, can we now go back to the days since Grinnell is gone to when they send an ambassador here who asks for the same things, but we get to ignore the person because they're saying that a quieter uh, tone. And it, it was obvious to everybody in America that that's what um, the German government wanted as well. They want an ambassador who is going to politely ask them to pay their NATO bill. And then when they don't pay their NATO bill, uh, they just ignore, they get ignored and they go away and they, they simply take that as an answer. And I think the outsider like Donald Trump was just looking at the bottom line and saying, you know, this is, this is silly. We, if, if NATO is going to be strong, we, if we believe in NATO, then pay your obligation. It's pretty simple. Yes, uh, that's that's really good point. Uh, uh, when I was uh, in Canada serving my diplomatic uh, mission, uh, I, I was uh, an expert at our embassy in, in Ottawa. Uh, I remember the the context you you mentioned that that orientation for, uh, on results, you know, focusing on results is uh, is really important, and sometimes the bureaucratic. Uh, apparatus uh, miss, misses this point, this important point. So, fresh, uh, fresh decision makers uh, in politics and including diplomacy, it's it can be really a game changer. Yeah. And, and let me let me just add one point that I think I failed to to emphasize in that um, I'm all for uh, political journalists and NGO types um, critiquing whether or not someone's style works. In diplomacy, everybody has a different style. And I think it's fair game to critique whether or not Donald Trump's uh, style worked and whether or not Barack Obama's style worked. It's clear that many in Ger Germany and many in Europe love the style of Barack Obama or Joe Biden. But by any rational measure, when you look to see, say, for, for NATO spending, NATO uh, payments and NATO spending increased, increased under Donald Trump dramatically. Now, many countries, including Germany, did not get to their 2% obligation, but they increased their, their spending. They increased uh, towards that goal. And uh, it was pretty dramatic. I, I think by any fair measure, you would have to look back and say that Donald Trump's style worked and made NATO stronger compared to Barack Obama's style or Joe Biden's style. Yes, and you know, I, I would like to, to believe that uh, that uh, current administration uh, of the US uh, uh, will be successful in this policy. So we, we will just have to have to wait for the results you mentioned. Thank you. And yes, and uh, one of the, I think, um, area, domain uh, in which we can observe, in which we will be able to observe the results will be economic cooperation. The uh, US and Germany has uh, very strong uh, economic ties and vibrant uh, trade, uh, uh, trade exchange, but it's, uh, it is not beneficial uh, to the US right now, right? That there is still a a massive trade deficit, deficit if, I, if I'm correct. There, there is still some. We, we have made dramatic progress, but you're right. Um, you know, one thing that is very clear after serving as U.S. Ambassador to Germany, I can tell you that the German business community functions almost identically like the American business community. They really are one and the same, and there's, there's a very, it's very hard now to tell many companies whether or not those companies are uh, totally German or totally American because they're intertwined. For instance, Lufthansa, the great German airline, has 15,000 American employees living in the United States. And so uh, I could go through, you know, uh, Siemens and all of the car companies and Bayer all of these great German companies, 
and very successful German companies employ tens of thousands of Americans. And so we're really intertwined when it comes to the, the business community. And uh, what I learned when I was in Germany is that the business community really does its own thing. It's, it, it may give lip service to the German government, but it is believing in capitalism. It's invested in the United States in very big ways. And I don't believe that that's ever going to go away. We can work on, on growing these companies, but in some ways, uh, the, the deficit that you refer to um, needs to take into consideration all of the jobs, the American jobs that are, are being made uh, from uh, companies that are based in Germany. Yes, uh, agree, and uh, I think you know Germany. If I if I may, if my uh, my data is correct, uh, Germany uh, invested uh, approximately four to five times more in in, uh, in U.S. than uh, otherwise uh, otherwise uh, than U.S. in Germany. It's like foreign di direct investments uh, uh, of Germany in U.S. is like five hundred uh, billion uh, U.S. dollars, and almost 900,000 jobs, uh, which is really significant, as you mentioned. So, uh, do you think uh, that um, when, when we could talk about Europe, uh, uh, Central Europe in general, uh, do you think that uh, current uh, US administration will, uh, will be interested in um, effective introduction of, of the Free Sea Initiative um, project, which could be also uh, regarded as a tool for you know, increasing energy security in, in Central Europe and you know, somehow uh, countering the, the malign, let's say, uh, effects of, of Nord Stream 2-like uh, projects. I think so. I think the Three Seas Initiative is, is going to be wide, widely supported. It certainly is um, in the State Department, in Treasury, in a variety of U.S. agencies. And I think the Biden administration uh, will absolutely take the initiative and further it and, and really uh, help it grow. It's a wonderful initiative, but also I think um, there is a bipartisan support for recognizing that more can be done for our allies in uh, Central Europe. And I, I think COVID has only made it uh, more clear that the, the Chinese initiatives, the Belt and Road initiatives, are, are really uh, not comparable to, to what the Americans and the Transatlantic Alliance can do when we work together. Yes, I, I would like to also see the, uh, the increasing of the, uh, the speed of, of, of introduction of certain projects uh, uh, within Free Sea Initiative. Uh, that the initiative has, I think, more than five years uh, of existence now, so it's, uh, I think it's time to, to just speed up. I came to, I came to Warsaw uh, to attend a conference on the Three Seas Initiative led by our great U.S. Ambassador Georgette Mosbacher, our U.S. Ambassador to, to Poland. And yes. she was an incredible force for that initiative and still to this day remains someone who is constantly talking about it and pushing it where she can. So uh, I think the initiative has got some big uh, supporters and that doesn't seem to be going away. Yes, uh, uh, Richard, could you please uh, share more, more your thoughts on, on uh, the outcome of the elections in Germany? I know you mentioned this uh, uh, briefly, but do you think that Angela Merkel government will be, uh, I mean, will be still, that Angela Merkel will be still a, a chancellor? Well, she has said that she's no longer going to be the chancellor and um, he's not running, so... Uh, we will we will see the end of the Merkel administration um, this year, and she's got a remarkable record. She's done some great things. Uh, I actually like her very much um, personally. She's a, a very nice person, an incredible diplomat, and a real strong leader for Germany. And she fights hard for Germany. And I, and I think 
that that's exactly what we should expect of leaders is that they fight for their country. Um, I, I don't blame Europe for wanting to get America to pay more and to, to take uh, more of a leadership role. But in many ways, the transatlantic alliance um, strengthens when we both do our parts. And so I'm looking forward to uh, trying to grow the transatlantic relationship between America, Germany, and Europe. And I, I think we'll have some new opportunities uh, with the new German government. Whenever there's a change in government, there's always opportunities, um, you know, not just liabilities of relationships that go away, but it'll also I believe that new uh, initiatives can be formed with the new people. And so I hope that uh, whoever joins the, the coalition government, it clearly looks like it will have to be a coalition government, that all of those individuals uh, really understand that the transatlantic alliance um, has to be supported and not just with lip service, but with action. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to the, the post-electoral Germany, um, if we could uh, touch the subject of nuclear sharing agreement and uh, nuclear cooperation between uh, Germany, US and NATO. Uh, do you think that uh, there are some, uh, let's say, um, there is uh, a real possibility that uh, uh, this nuclear sharing uh, partnership uh, can be, um, let's say, uh, deteriorated with time? Or it's it's just uh, you know it's, it's whether it's stable or or not. Uh, explain that a little bit more. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the presence of uh, U.S. nuclear weapons in in Europe, including Germany, and the, their political, let's say, uh, tendencies and signals that it should be uh, whether sustained or, or uh, uh, even maybe increased, right? Because it's very important this for uh, security here. Yeah, this is an issue that we, we dealt with pretty consistently. And um, I have to say that I have to be very cautious in how I talk about this because we always want to be careful about what we say publicly. But um, make no mistake that we have good German partners when it comes to uh, our security agreements. And I don't think that there's an appetite in Germany, uh, even, even in the current government or throughout Europe, to, ch to dramatically change those security agreements. We have uh, a long history on these agreements. They work well and they're valued on both sides. I know that we've had some issues locally uh, when it comes to fencing and other issues, but I think that's pretty typical um, to have some of those local uh, issues flare up. And we're always willing to talk and learn and adjust uh, when it comes to uh, the, the security fencing and, and those issues that seem to uh, pop up every once in a while. But the larger issues of security cooperation, I think, are solid, and I don't see them uh, changing in any substantive way. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, if we could um, uh, talk a little bit about energy security of the U.S. and um, the um, Biden's administration uh, focus on let's say, development of green technologies and um, diminishing the, the significance of uh, development of uh, crude oil and natural gas. Uh, there are some American experts uh, who see this as a threat to this energy independence process that has been, um, uh, let's say, in progress in the US. Do you think that we have to worry about this? Well, look, the, the dramatic um, explosion of, of American energy, where we've gone from uh, being an energy exporter to an energy uh, 
or for an energy importer to being an energy exporter has been dramatic. And uh, in many ways, I credit fracking uh, for being able to unleash our liquid natural gas supplies. And to be able to safely find the sources and then package them for import uh, or for export, it was pretty amazing. And when you think about that, and you think about we have the ability now to export our, our natural, our liquid natural gas and do it in a way that helps not only our economy, but our national security, because we're going to be able to have partners that will use this renewable source. Uh, I think that needs to be fiercely protected. And it needs to be fiercely protected by uh, accurate information. And there's been too many times that I think the enemies of fracking have tried to make up information about it being unsafe. And, and that seems to be an attack on this, uh, this new energy source. And I'll give you one example on it is that we do not have a terminal, an LNG terminal on the entire west coast of the United States. And that's because we have uh, three uh, governors in the United States who believe that fracking is bad and unsafe. And they are science deniers because the science will show that it is very safe. And what they're really denying is not only the science, but they're denying the ability to create jobs on the west coast and to be able to have uh, liquid natural gas exported to Asia in a more competitive way. And so we've got some domestic issues that we've got to work on in the United States if we're going to continue to be able to be a leader in the LNG space. Uh, during this last campaign, fracking became an issue in Pennsylvania, which is a very important state in the election, where President Trump and uh, candidate Biden at the time were arguing about whether or not uh, fracking would be protected to continue. And I wanna make it very clear is that fracking is safe. Anyone who says it's not safe is not reading the science. They're being emotional and manipulating the evidence. And so we believe that uh, when, you, when you concentrate on the science and you look at the science and you come to the conclusion that fracking is absolutely safe and it will unleash a energy source that we weren't able to get to before, um, that, that should be protected and fiercely protected. And uh, I, I think that other countries can learn from this 10-year uh, fight that we had to be able to look at nuclear energy. I mean, why is it that there's nuclear energy in France, but you know, Germans have decided that they're getting rid of it? And, and won't have it. And so I, I think that when, when you look at different energy sources, you always have to uh, make sure that you're looking at the science, not the emotions of it in order to utilize it to it. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100% because uh, uh, I, was, I was working uh, here in Europe uh, to uh, to pur pursue the development of, of shale gas, natural gas, and other unconventionals. Uh, so I remember the, the disinformation uh, at that time, and uh, and how easily it is to to present uh, some information without uh, any connection to scientific knowledge and uh, and facts. It just it's easier, and and has a great. Uh, let's say, negative potential in, in it. Uh, at the G7 uh, summit uh, recently, uh, countries of, of the group, uh, and, let's say, uh, called to tackle actions uh, against, against the uh, cyber uh, criminals in Russia. And uh, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on this uh, in the context of recent uh, attacks, cyber attacks on U.S. companies and other entities? Look, the, the cyber attacks are very troubling and the evidence shows that they're coming from Central and Eastern Europe and in, uh, in Russia. And 
we have to be able to uh, call it out and make sure that it doesn't happen. But we have a system in the United States where private companies are uh, in charge of their cybersecurity, not the government. Government can do a lot. They can benchmark. They can help figure out when there's uh, an attack, if we, who, who is doing the attack. They can assist in, in finding that information. And then certainly it's government's role to respond. But uh, private companies are going to have to realize that they have to spend more to protect their own assets. They save a lot of money by utilizing technology. And sometimes what they're going to have to do is take some of that savings and pour it into the protection of those assets. And I think that what we're seeing in the United States is that sometimes companies haven't spent enough. They need to do more. They need to understand that they are going to be a target. Americans are always a target. So American companies uh, have to understand that they too are going to be a target of the, the cyber hackers. And it's a very serious issue for countries that uh, utilize the internet and connectivity in a way to uh, control a lot of the different parts of, of society. And so we've got to get it right and we can't just blame the government. That's not our system to say it's the government's responsibility to protect against cyber attacks when the, the first stop is the private sector and, and the companies that are being attacked. They have to spend to protect themselves and their own assets. And thank you very much, uh, 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 Rick, and thank you for your thoughts and your time. Uh, our time is running out here, and I would like to conclude our today's meeting. Uh, maybe you, you would like to add something at the end? No, just thank you very much, Thomas, for allowing this detailed conversation. I appreciate it. Um, we certainly appreciate the Warsaw Institute, all of your work, our great relations between America and Poland and uh, America and Germany. Uh, we have great partners there. And when we talk about how to improve, it's because we believe that we have partners that we can be honest with and uh, work together to make both of our countries better. Thank you very much for, for the warm words and uh, I don't have any, any better, let's say, conclusion. Uh, so let me just thank our viewers and uh, thank you and see you at the next event in Diplomacy Talk series. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard.